Welcome to the Daily Growth Book. We're now on Mark chapter 8. What a great chapter. It's a little long chapter as well, but there's some really great insights. And it starts off with a familiar miracle. Jesus fed 5,000, and we've all heard about that story. But this story and this chapter begins with him feeding 4,000. He's doing the same miracle again. It's interesting that he does the same miracle again, and we see him doing miracles over and over. And I think it's to reinforce, I'm your provider. I'm your healer. I'm your deliverer. So he does it over and over again. So we'll know it wasn't a fluke. It wasn't an accident. This is what I do. Let's look at it. Mark chapter 8, verse 1. About this time, another large crowd had gathered, and the people ran out of food again. Jesus called his disciples and told them, I feel sorry for these people. They have, been, they have been here with me three days, and they have nothing left to eat. If I send them home hungry, they will faint along the way, for some of them have come a long distance. His disciples replied, How are we supposed to find enough food to feed them out here in the wilderness? Jesus asked, How much bread do you have? And they said, Seven loaves. Interesting. This is what Jesus did. He saw the need. He was aware of it. He's aware of every single one of our needs. But he does something really important. He makes his disciples aware of the need. This is exactly what Jesus does today. There's need all over this world. And he can't meet that need until his disciples or until we're, we are aware of the need. But anytime that God is revealing a need to us, his vision to us, we must understand he does not reveal the need without his supernatural provision. The disciples automatically went back and said, how are we supposed to feed these thousands of people? They soon forgot that Jesus did the same exact miracle uh, before. He sped 5,000. There were actually less people here. They began to refer to their own means, their own resources. See, when God has given us a vision, what he's saying is, let's partner up. I'm going to give you the vision, but I'm going to provide the supernatural. So Jesus says, give me what you have. This time, the first miracle when they, when they fed the 5,000, they borrowed some fish and loaves from a little boy. This time, Jesus says, give me what you have. So they had seven loaves. And we find out later, they don't, not only had seven loaves, they had three fish as well. But they, this is what they did. They held back the fish and they said, we're going to give you the seven loaves. And this is what Jesus did. He prayed for the seven loaves. He broke it. And he gave it right back to the disciples to distribute. This is exactly how God does ministry. He does it through us. It is a partnership. We give him what we have and he multiplies it. Understand this. God can only multiply what we put in his hands. That means your time, your effort, your talents, your finances. We put what we have in, our, in God's hands, the not enough. And God takes our not enough and makes it into more than enough. And that's why it, this story is about Jesus feeding the 5,000. He gets all the glory. Of course, we do the work and we do our part, but he's the one that blesses it. And he's the one that, that causes a supernatural multiplication. At the end, everyone ate as much as they wanted. They were fully satisfied. And this is what Jesus did again. There were seven baskets full of food left over. He was reminding the disciples, you can never outgive me. And every time you, me and you partner up to do ministry, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to make sure that you have more than enough so you can do it again and again. So Jesus did this miracle again. We soon forget. We see these disciples, and I think they're a lot like we are they forget really quickly what Jesus has done. Maybe this is something that we need to work on, and that's why praising the Lord and thanking Him and praying to Him on a daily basis or even saying thank you is so important because it reminds us of what He's already done. And when we have faith in what He's done, 
we could see that miracle happen again. The truth is, we're going to face need, we're going to have lack, and we're going to face people with need and lack. But Jesus is our provider. Isn't that good news? Now we go into the second section, and we see a turn, and we, we were now panning in, if this was a camera, it would pan into these Pharisees, these religious leaders. Jesus just did a miracle, fed 4,000, and now these Pharisees, I'm sure they were around because the Bible says that these Pharisees were always around Jesus. They weren't there to, to serve him, to praise him, to thank him for a miracle, but they are looking for a miracle. They were there to find something wrong with Jesus. And look what it says in verse 11. When the Pharisees heard that Jesus had arrived, they came and started to argue with him. Testing him, they demanded um, that he show them a miraculous sign from heaven to prove his authority. Think about this. These religious leaders are so prideful and so arrogant they're literally coming to argue and test Jesus. They're arguing with God. <laughs> they're testing God. And they're doing the same exact thing that Satan did. They're demanding a miracle. Satan did this when Jesus was in the wilderness. If you're God, why don't you turn these stones into bread? And this is exactly what they were doing. If you are who you say you are, we demand that you give us a miracle. This is what I've learned about people that refuse to believe. It really doesn't matter what miracles they see. It doesn't matter what evidence you show them. It doesn't, it doesn't matter how well you argue. If someone is refusing to believe, they're refusing to believe. And at the end of the miracle, they're going to say, well, I don't think you really did that miracle. And they'll justify it away. So Jesus is, is in a predicament. Is he going to show them a miracle? But Jesus, we know one of his teachings are, don't throw pearls of pigs. It's so important to realize when you're arguing with somebody, you're really wasting your time. The Bible says, stay away from foolish arguments. I've learned this. If someone could be argued into it, they could be argued out of it. Let's stay away from arguing. Let's find some people that really have need, that know that they're sinners in need of a savior, and let's share the good news with them. So we find out that Jesus refused to give them a miracle, and he walked away. Well, why did he walk away? Because he knew it was just a waste of time. It didn't matter if he did a miracle. They just weren't going to believe. And he was going to now search for some people that needed him and realize that they needed him. So we go on, and Jesus now is going over the situation with his disciples. Um, but the disciples were arguing about something. They were arguing because as they left to... They, left, they got on the boat and they were going on the other side of the shore. They were arguing that they didn't have enough bread. This bread issue comes up again. They're arguing, you should have brought the bread or you should have brought the bread. <laughs> and they're arguing they don't have enough bread. But Jesus says something really interesting while they were arguing. He says in verse 15, as they were crossing the lake, Jesus warned them, watch. He goes, watch out. Be, beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and of Herod. Now, Jesus is still thinking about what the Pharisees were saying. They're thinking about physical bread, the disciples. Jesus is thinking about their teaching. And what, he, what, he, what he's saying, the Pharisees' yeast or their teaching, he goes, be careful with, um, with this teaching that it doesn't influence your thinking because it's very, very dangerous. But he just didn't say the Pharisees. He also said Herod. And what he was saying is, be careful with the false teachings of the Pharisees or religious people, but also be careful with the teachings or the values of our society or government or people because they can actually influence your thinking to not believe in me. I was talking to a young man this week and, and he messed up. He, he actually backslid and he, he said, man, I, I thought I really got set free from marijuana and he had a really tough time. And he goes, I went and I smoked one more joint, one more time. And I, just, and I felt like, man, I am so unrighteous. I'm so wrong. I'm, no, I'm condemned. And he felt like he no longer was a believer. You know, his, and, I, and I talked to him, Omar, 
The Bible says if you sin, you know what you're supposed to do? Confess your sins, and God is faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. The fact that he felt like, man, I really messed up, was showing that God is working with him and that he had conviction. Before he became a believer, he didn't have that conviction. But the devil will do something like this. He'll tell you, beware. This, this is what Jesus is talking Beware of the yeast of the Pharisees. That they'll make you focus on your righteousness. I'm right with God but based on how well I behave. And Jesus is saying this. You're not right with me based on how well you behave, on your perfect behavior. You're right with me because I've forgiven you. I've made you righteous. You are not going to heaven based on what you've done. You're going to heaven based on what I've done. You see, the, the Pharisees were producing or were actually selling or teaching religion, faith in man's works. And Jesus was preaching salvation, the good news, faith in my work and what I do. See, you and I are saved not because we're perfect. We are saved because Jesus is perfect. We are saved not because we're so righteous in our deeds. We are saved because Jesus is so righteous in his deeds and what he did on the cross for every one of us. The difference between the Pharisees and Jesus, the Pharisees were trying to produce salvation through their own works or self-righteousness, and Jesus was given a gift of salvation through his work and faith in him. So we're saved by faith in Jesus Christ. So he warned them, be careful that you do not get influenced by the yeast of the teachings of the religious or Herod or our society. Let's keep on going. Now we see another miracle. It's amazing. Jesus goes from teaching to miracles, teaching to miracles. Now we see another miracle. And this miracle is a man that was blind that's now going to see. When In verse 22, when they arrived at Bethsaida, some people brought a blind man to Jesus and they begged him to touch the man and heal him. So now this, is, this miracle begins with people bringing a blind man to Jesus and begging Jesus to touch him and heal him. We see this over and over as well. This is a pattern. People bringing people to Jesus. Isn't that amazing? That Jesus continues to use people to reach people. This is exactly how he does it. They not only bring them, they're the ones that pray or ask on his behalf. Please, Jesus, touch him so he can see. We've heard that you heal the blind. We've heard that you give, you give, you give, you give um, um, hearing to those who are deaf. We hear that you walk on water. We hear that you set people free. Can you do it for him? And this is what Jesus did. Jesus took the man aside and he does something different. He spits in his eyes. Now, some people say this, they spit in his eyes, um, and that was a part of the miracle. But, uh, but we've also read that it was a practical thing. It was a natural thing that he did because many times blind people, those who were blind, had their eyes closed and, and, they, were, and they had some film. And, and what he did was just loosen it so he could open his eyes and begin the miracle. But either way, this is how the miracle happened. The man looked around. And Jesus asked him, do you see anything now? And the Bible said, the man looked around. He goes, I see people, but I can't see them clearly. And you know what Jesus did? He touches them again. And when he touches them again, his sight was completely restored and he could see everything clearly. You know, this is the first miracle that we see is kind of a progressive miracle that he touched them, but he needed one more touch. Maybe in your life today, there's a progressive miracle happening in your life. You've already had a touch of the Lord, but there's another touch coming. And you know, this is so cool, great, because what, what God starts, he finishes. And what he do, when he finishes it, it's complete and it's completely restored. You might be in a process right now where you feel like, whoa, my life is not way, the way I think it should be quite yet, but it is better than it was. That's the truth. We can't forget where we came from. And that's what we got to focus on. Man, I've come a long way. 
I might not be where I want to be quite yet, but I am better than I have been. And that's what God does in our lives. Because even miracles, a lot of miracles are life transformation. It's called sanctification. Every day we're becoming more and more like Christ. But there's a promise. He who has begun a good work in you will complete it. But we also see some miracles are done exactly this way, where someone gets prayed for and they feel better. But as they go, they get better and better and better. Don't give up on your miracle. Maybe you can't see totally clearly yet, but this is what God is promising you. I will complete what I've started. Isn't that great? Now, Jesus now goes in the next section. Jesus is after this miracle, he has some time with his disciples. And we see Jesus with the crowd. Then he spends time with his disciples. This is another pattern that we see. And this is a pattern that we should develop in our lives. We come to church and then we should spend time with the circle, with people around us that we're sharing our faith with, our experiences with. And we call these small groups. I think everybody should be part of the big crowd in church, but also we should be part of a discipleship group where we're bringing people around us and teaching them or talking, talking to them about our experiences, teaching them what we've learned. Now, Jesus is asking a real important question. And then he asked a question in verse, in verse um, let me see, 27. He asked the disciples, who do people say I am? And the disciples said, well, people say that you're John the Baptist. Well, that wouldn't make sense because Jesus and John the Baptist were uh, alive at the same exact time and, and, and many times the same places. And, but then some say you're Elijah. And then Jesus like, brings it home and he goes, okay, who do you say I am? Now, that's the big question. Who do you say Jesus is? There's some people that say Jesus is a great prophet or he's a great teacher or he's a great philosopher, or he was a great example, or he was a, a man that lived 2,000 years ago um, that was a, a guru. People say all kinds of things about Jesus. People, Some people say he was even a false teacher. We'll see this in scripture. But Jesus asked his disciples, but well, who do you say I am? This is the most important question that anybody will ever ask you. Who is Jesus to you? Now, the, uh, Peter stood up, Peter said, Peter replied, you are the Messiah. And, and, and then Jesus, said, and Jesus warned them to not tell anybody about this. He goes, good answer, Peter. You know who I am. I am the Messiah, the Savior. Jesus said about himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. There's only one Messiah. There's only one Savior. There's only one Deliverer. There's only one source of eternal life. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to heaven but through Him. They got the right answer. Is that an answer that you have already? I pray that you get this revelation. Jesus is the Savior. The Bible says there's no other name to call on to be saved but Jesus Christ. All that call upon the name of the Lord will be saved saved. Saved from what? The power of sin. Saved from the, the misery of sin. Saved from the judgment of sin. I thank God that Jesus, that God sent his only son to take our place and pay the full price for all of our sins. Now Jesus in this next section is now showing them, showing his disciples how he's going to save them. This is the first time he's mentioning that he is going to suffer, he's going to die, he's going to be buried and resurrected. Let's see what Jesus prophesies about his near future. In verse 31, it says, Then Jesus began to tell them that the Son of Man, which is him, must suffer many terrible things and be rejected by the elders and the leading priests and the teachers of religious law. He would be killed. And in, but three days later, he would rise from the dead. As he talked about this openly with his disciples, Peter took him aside and began to reprimand him by saying such things. For, for saying such, such things, Jesus turned around and looked at his disciples, then reprimanded Peter. And he, get away from me, Satan. He said, you are seeing things merely 
from a human point of view, not from God's. How interesting. In the same chapter, Peter is acknowledged for saying, you are the Messiah. In the same chapter, almost the same conversation, Jesus is being rebuked as Satan. Wow. It really shows how we, as, as human beings, even as believers, that one day we could be, or one moment, we could be in the Spirit, being led by the Spirit, and the next moment, being led by our flesh. Same person. And that's why we have to have so much mercy on one another. The Bible says, make an allowance for each other's faults. Do you understand that even though you're a believer and people are believers around you, or maybe even some people that you esteem as leaders, they still have the potential to do what Peter did. That means one moment be in the spirit and the next moment be totally fleshly. And looking at things from a human point of view, it's true. And that's why we need to make an allowance for each other's faults. But Jesus rebukes it. And this is the way we do spiritual warfare as well. When we hear an idea that comes from our flesh or human point of view that limits a miracle of God, we need to be quick to resist it and identify that's a statement or a thought that came from Satan. I rebuke that thought in the name of Jesus. Not every thought should you accept. We need to reject certain thoughts. We receive the word of God, but we reject, reject the thoughts of the enemy. And the thoughts of the enemy come in many different ways. You're, you're nobody. You're not really saved. You can't do it. You'll never overcome. You'll always be the same. No one likes you. Everybody's against you. The under, understand this. Once you receive those thoughts, they empower you. And they empower the enemy to destroy you. Because it becomes part of your perspective, how you see things. And as long as you see things in the wrong way, this is what's going to happen. It's going to affect your outcomes in your relationships. It's going to affect your outcomes in your ministry because this is the way you're looking at it. So Jesus automatically rebukes that thought because that thought was trying to stop him from going to the cross. Now, then Jesus, now after he rebukes Peter, goes into the final section of this chapter we go into the final section of this chapter, and he begins to speak to the crowd one more time. He, now, this is how it goes. He's speaking to the crowd. He speaks to the disciples, and now he's going back and speaking to the crowd. Then calling the crowd to join his disciples, he said, If any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross, and follow me. If you try to hang on to, to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake and for the sake of the good news, you will save it. And what do you b benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my message in these adulterous and sinful days, the Son of Man will be ashamed of that person when he returns in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Wow. Jesus sets the standard. And he's saying, now, crowd, if you want to follow me, you must be willing to give up your life. Give up your ways. Give up your sinful ways. We cannot preach the gospel without a strong emphasis on repentance. There must be a repentance of sin. We cannot turn to God if we're not turning from our own ways. Doing it our way is not doing it God's way. That's just the way it is. So the reason we have to turn from our way is because it stops us from turning to the way, which is Jesus Christ. Jesus has so much for us. Be careful that you don't put things, money, your agenda over the Lord. There's people that put riches over the Lord. They put relationships over the Lord. They put things over the Lord. They put their careers over the Lord. It's nothing wrong with having a career. There's nothing wrong with having a relationship. There's nothing wrong with making a lot of money. But there is a problem that it becomes your leader. And it stops us from serving the Lord. And Jesus said a major statement. He goes, what is a profit if you gain the whole world? That means every one of your dreams, aspirations, and goals and visions actually comes to pass. You live in the house you want. You climb the corporate ladder. You make all the money. You have all the relationships, 
And at the end, you lose your soul. Jesus put in everything in perspective. He's saying, don't forget, there's eternal life after this. And there's a soul to gain and a soul to lose. That means you could be with the Lord forever and ever and ever in heaven, in a place with no death, no suffering, no crimes, no misery, no depression, no bondage, no addiction, forever in heaven, no devil in heaven forever. Or you could be separated from God in a hell forever. And that's the reality. And Jesus put in everything back in perspective. I died. I resurrected from the dead to give you eternal life. Because without my death, you could not have eternal life. The price for your sins had to be paid for. I paid it. And if you don't place your faith in me, then you're going to pay for it. Place your faith in Jesus Christ before it's too late. And then Jesus says, be careful in these adulterous and sinful days that you're ashamed of Jesus. Are there some people maybe today that are ashamed of Jesus? Like, this is what happens. We're in church. We're excited. But when we go out into the world, we're ashamed to mention the name of Jesus that we represent him. Or we're not publicly confessing. Jesus is my Lord and Savior. And Jesus is saying, if you confess him before men, he'll confess you before the Father. But if you're ashamed of him and you deny him before men, this is what he's going to say. I'll have to agree with your decision because I've given you freedom of choice and I have to deny you before my Father. And I'll only deny you because you denied me. I've chosen you. Today, God is choosing the hurting, the broken, the lost. Not condemning them, but choosing. Hey, follow me. But to follow me, you got to give up your way. What a wonderful chapter. We've seen Jesus feeding 4,000 people through the hands of disciples that aren't, sure, that aren't quite there yet. It's amazing how God does miracles while we're still in the process of building our faith. And, and then he heals a blind man. And we see he touches him once, that touches him again. A miracle happens. And then he now prophesies his suffering, death, and resurrection. And he ends this chapter with a call. Follow me. Give up everything to follow me. And you'll have everything you've ever desired in life. Let's go ahead and pray. For, Father, we just thank you for your word today. We thank you, Lord, that we realize in this chapter, you are our provider. You fed the 4,000 with just seven loaves and, and three small fish. And you could do it again. You show us a need, then you supernaturally provide through our hands. We give you our not enough, and you turn it into more than enough. And then you ask us a question, who do you say I am? And we say today, you are our Savior. You are our Messiah. You are our Deliverer. You are our Provider. You are the source of eternal life. And we confess you as our Lord and Savior. We thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayers today. And we thank you for helping us grow and understand your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Love you guys. Let's continue to grow together. Love you. Have a great, great week. Thank you.